My name is Justin, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> uh, I think one of the most interesting things about working in and around Bitcoin and crypto finance is all of the interesting people that I get to meet. And everybody has an interesting story uh, or anecdote about how they, uh, they became interested in Bitcoin. So what, what brought you to Bitcoin? And so I have, uh, I have two anecdotes. I'll share with you personal anecdotes about how I got started. And, uh, and maybe that gives you some insight into how I think about cryptocurrency. So <clears throat> a couple years ago, uh, banks and, and financial service institutions, uh, they started offering a, a product called online banking. And this was a little while ago, uh, but it was really convenient. And so <clears throat> I, I didn't know much about money and I also didn't really care. Uh, I was the type of person that, uh, that didn't keep much food on hand in my cabinets. I, I ran my life as a just-in-time factory. So it's a, it's a Kanban system and I would go to the grocery store when I needed food. And so one day I ran out of food and, uh, and I go to the grocery store and I went to pay <clears throat> and I used the credit card and it didn't work. And then I used the debit card and it didn't work. And you know, the other interesting thing is that uh, I didn't have any cash on me at the time because uh, I thought cash was, was inconvenient. I thought it was sort of dirty and uh, just was ancient. Why would I use this when I have this digital system? And, uh, and also the bank made me pay to take out cash. So this was uh, a strong incentive to not use it. So I, I realized at that point that uh, I didn't have many options. I, I couldn't eat until I got in touch with the bank. So I left the grocery store uh, hungry and now annoyed and I called the bank and I, I said, what's, what's going on with my, with my cards? Why don't they work? And, uh, and the guy said, oh, well, we froze your accounts because we're not sure we have your current address. And I, I said, I, that doesn't make much sense. I said, uh, I'm, you have my address. You know, I, I gave you my, my post office box or my post, my post account. And uh, he said, well, no, we have to have your residential address. And that's the point where I, I started to really think, that's, that's strange. I said, why do you need to know where I sleep? And he said, it's because it's the law. We have to know your residential address. And I thought that was really, really strange. So basically they were holding my, my money hostage and, and me hostage because I didn't plan ahead and I was hungry. And so now I was totally subject to uh, the whims of, of my, what I thought was my business partner. I thought I was sort of doing business with them, but Actually, there was something else going on, and uh, and I realized later that this is this is soft power. It's a it's a form of control, and uh, and it's wielded as, as a weapon today uh, in certain circumstances. And you know, I I just sort of stumbled across it unwittingly, and uh, so what ended up happening is I started using cash a lot. And uh, I closed down my, my bank account with them. And uh, now I, I, use, I use cash pretty frequently. Uh, <clears throat> now, what I learned from this is that financial sovereignty is really important. And uh, a short while after, I started really getting into Bitcoin. And Bitcoin is really nice because with Bitcoin, I know that, uh, that that circumstance can never happen to me again. So I know that it will always be there for me and it will always work. I know that, uh, that it's absolutely resilient and censorship resistant and, uh, and I like that very much about it. Uh, it's, it's very much financial sovereignty and, uh, and that's non-optional. So the other concept is that by default, uh, Bitcoin is, is going to be there for you and defaults are important. So there's one other kind of interesting uh, thing or anecdote that happened. 
and uh, and and this also helps shape my my perspective or my worldview on cryptocurrency. <clears throat> I was uh, I was traveling back to Chicago one time through Miami, and I was uh, I was selected for some additional screening, and I went over to the the desk, and uh, and the guy puts on his gloves, and he, he very carefully goes through my bag. And he spends a lot of time, he, he's really looking and hoping, I think, to find something. And I was, I started to watch him very carefully too, because I, I started to become suspicious that this guy might put something in there. <laughs> maybe he's looking for a promotion, or maybe he had a quota or something, I, I don't know. But I, I'd never really thought about it until that point. And, uh, and so, after a while, he, he sort of gets frustrated uh, and he goes over to a computer and he starts typing and he types and types and then at some point he looks up and he says what what were you doing in Bangkok last year and, and he says and then what were you doing in Kuala Lumpur a couple weeks later and <laughs> I, I thought well that's that's also really strange uh, I, I guess I shouldn't be surprised that someone has access to my flight records but I never thought it would be this guy and I, I didn't think it would be wielded as a as a weapon like this. I felt like I was I was being attacked, and uh, and so the, the the incident sort of closed without much uh, without much ado. I mean, I eventually didn't find anything, and he was sort of dissatisfied, and so was I, and so the relationship ended in mutual contempt, <laughs> and. And I left, and I, I wrote an email to uh, to the department, and and they apologized. So that was nice. I give them credit. <laughs> but what I realized was that uh, at this point, financial and and in your data privacy is really important because uh, you can be caught in an unexpected unexpected circumstance, and somebody could start to use that against you, and uh, and and that made me also very uncomfortable. So one, one thing with, uh, with Bitcoin that I knew from the beginning was that privacy in Bitcoin is a, is a really fragile thing. Uh, by, by default, if you start using the system, uh, it's okay, it's, it's pseudonymous. You know, if you don't have your identity linked to your activity, then, um, then you can sort of use it safely. So if you always use cash and you always use a VPN or Tor or something like that, well, maybe it's okay. But the reality is that at some point we all kind of fall. We all we all sort of give in to some sort of temptation, whether it's an airdrop or um, you know there's a fork that happens, and so you want to sell the 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 thing that forks off of your Bitcoin um, or something like that. At some point, you end up either wittingly or unwittingly giving up your ID. And then you taint all of your Bitcoin activity. And I think that's really dangerous. <clears throat> also, most of the ATMs, uh, the Bitcoin ATMs, are tracking everything that you do. And, uh, and I find that's also dangerous. So essentially, for me, privacy in Bitcoin is, is completely gone. So I know in Bitcoin, everything I do is being tracked. I know in the back of my mind that I might get caught at some point and someone will ask me about everything that I've ever done in Bitcoin. And that, that really bothered me. So for a number of years, I was looking for a tool that, uh, that had, had some nice privacy properties to it. And I looked and looked and I, I was never satisfied. Dark coin, dark coin came and went, and black coin came and went, and all of these things came through my filter, and uh, and I ejected them for one reason or another. And uh, it wasn't until earlier this year that I had lunch with a friend of mine uh, at Google in Zurich, and uh, and he said, "Hey, get a load of this thing. <clears throat> it started as a scam, and uh, and then." It was a scam started by smart people, and then there was a coup, and the smart developers kicked out the, the previous developers, and they took this coin over, and then they underwent the fatal privacy flaw um, that is inherent in, uh, 
in a totally private coin. The, uh, the unlimited creation problem. And so they, they found this flaw and they fixed it right away. And, uh, and then they told everybody else that was on that same protocol about it. And nobody else fixed the flaw, only they did. And they said, it's, it's called Monero, check it out. And so I did. And, uh, and I was really, really happy with what I saw. So I still have, of course, some, some technical concerns, but, uh, but that's true with, with all, all things in technology. You know, I, I approach things kind of from an engineering standpoint, and so we, we think in terms of probability. And, uh, and overall, I think Bitcoin is really nice because it gives you financial sovereignty, but Monero is really nice because I think it gives you financial sovereignty, but it also gives you privacy. And, and, and Monero, the, the case is that neither is optional. So by default, you're private in Monero. And that was really important because for normal people and for companies, privacy is key. So <clears throat> one thing that I think most people overlook or aren't really aware of is that in the banking system today, um, especially in Switzerland, you can actually buy privacy and you can buy quite good privacy. Uh, you need to have a lot of money, but if you have the money, then you can be very, very private, uh, exceptionally private. And <clears throat> the, uh, the problem though is that uh, that privacy is not infallible. The problem is that humans are still in control of that system and humans are infallible. Uh, fallible. <laughs> so, <clears throat> the, uh, there are a couple of very high profile cases over the last few years in Switzerland of private banks losing uh, client data or giving up client data. And uh, I mean, over 100,000 private bank clients have had their data either stolen or sold or something like that, either by insiders or by sort of foreign governments extorting them or something like that. And, uh, and that's, that's a problem, right? So even if you can't afford uh, privacy in the banking system for the, for the few people in the world that can, uh, even that is not guaranteed. So what we really need is a, is a technology that solves that problem. Anyway, the other problem with banking is that uh, banks have an adversarial relationship with their clients. And what I mean is that um, the bank is going to try to get absolutely everything it can from you and give as little back as possible. So it's, it's pure profit driven, uh, pure greed, which is fine. Um, but in today's system, people give the bank all of their money in the first place, and then the bank takes even more, as, as much as possible. And, uh, and, and that causes all kinds of problems. Uh, and, and so I think, again, we have technology that can solve some of these problems. So I think with technology, the, the banking world is going to change significantly. And, uh, and I think the role that banks play will, will change significantly. So in today's world, I don't know of many people that are satisfied with their banking relationships. Um, my guess is that most people still have bank accounts, even here. Um, it's hard to live off of Bitcoin at the moment. It's hard to live off of Monero. It's also hard to live off of cash if you're in a developed country. Uh, you're sort of on the fringe if you don't have a bank account. And, uh, I, but I think that will change significantly. So I have an idea of how banking changes in the near future. And uh, it's maybe, maybe we could call this my roadmap for, for private banking in the future. So I think the bank of tomorrow will start to do some, some interesting value added things. I think banking today is a cost or a tax on the productive economy. And I think banking tomorrow is actually a value added uh, industry. It, 
not only is a, a third of the global GDP uh, sort of recovered, but now we have something on top of it. And I think the bank is going to start doing things for their average clients that, uh, that most people have not really thought about yet. There are some quite progressive banks that, uh, that are already thinking down this path. So I think, first of all, I, I, I think your bank will start to audit your wallet code. I think they will hire smart people who will look at open source software, and they'll be able to tell you whether or not there are backdoors in it. They'll be able to tell you whether or not there are certain bugs in it that you know, expose you to certain threats. Uh, and I think, that's, I think that's a valuable service. I think the bank will also start to provide backups and restoration services. So actually, I, I got an email from UBS this morning, and it said, Dear Mr. Smith, did you know that we can help you manage your passwords and keep them safe with our safe storage locker service? And I thought, well, that's, that's nice. I use MacPass, but I, I compile it myself. <laughs> and the, but the problem is that most people can't compile software themselves. So it makes sense to me that the bank would reach out to its client base and it would start to offer uh, a software management or a uh, password management solution. I think that's quite nice because I think most people here that, that are experts do recommend that people use a password manager. So uh, I think that's, that's a fantastic move forward. I also think that banks will help train their clients to be safe online. I think they'll help people protect their identities. I think they'll help people control what kind of information they release online. And uh, I think they'll help also to provide identification and notary services. So no matter how we try to slice this pie, uh, in the real world, there's a human that has a link somehow to a physical object. And we call that link ownership. Uh, and we can see it in real estate today. So the question is, in the digital world, if someone is trying to sell a house uh, and you want to buy that house, how do you actually verify that the person trying to sell the house does, in fact, own the house? And so that's a difficult problem that we have. And I think banks will help solve that problem by, uh, by providing this identification and, and notarization service. Now, I think finally and most importantly, banks will use Monero. And uh, I think they'll recommend Monero in some cases. And I think the more astute banks will only work with clients uh, using Monero and not Bitcoin. Because banks today don't really like Bitcoin. But for a lot of reasons. But why won't they use Bitcoin? Number one, it's too easy to learn the identity, relationships, and actions of your client in Bitcoin. It's just way too easy. And that knowledge is a huge liability. So I grew up not too far from Chicago. And Chicago, you know, for years was well known as, a, as kind of a rough place. And, uh, and there was a mafia that was operating in Chicago. And the general advice when you were there, if you're walking down the street, is to walk like this. So you don't want to be looking around up at the buildings or the pretty architecture or anybody else and what they're doing. You just look at the direction that you're walking. If you hear gunshots and screams, just keep looking and just keep walking. And the reason is that if you become aware of the activities that are going on around you, you could be called to testify to your knowledge of those activities. And if you were compelled to testify, then you could end up dead. So you don't want to be party to any information that you really don't want to be party to, right? It's all about context. It's all about controlling the context. So knowing is a huge li liability, and I think that's why banks will use Monero. It's because in Monero, you don't know what your business partner was doing, and you really have no idea. So if somebody compels you to testify as to what you know, 
you don't know anything. So why do I like Monero and, and in sort of a general sense? I think Monero is sort of like cash in the mail. So when I was growing up, uh, maybe just before the, the internet came about, there were some times where you wanted to pay someone at a distance and you wanted to send them cash. But you shouldn't really send people cash in the mail because you could have a malicious postman or, or anybody else that just takes the cash out of the envelope and then there's no evidence that you paid. Uh, it's really difficult. In the US, they still use checks and that has its own problems. So we end up with this kind of terrible credit card solution for our distance payments or distance money transfers. We have Bitcoin now, but, uh, but again, Bitcoin is not quite the same as physical cash in the mail because in Bitcoin, somehow you can taint the transactions. Um, the other cool thing is that with Monero, you can still prove that you sent it. So uh, if somebody ever says, well, no, I actually didn't get the money, you can, you can prove uh, that, that you did send the money mathematically, and that's also quite nice. That's a nice feature. And then the other thing is that if you're walking down the street and euros fall out of your pocket, uh, most likely you're not going to get them back unless there's a, a good Samaritan that, that helps you, but the odds are low. So with Monero, the money, of course, is stored on your hardware. And if you lose the hardware, you can restore it. Uh, and I think that is also uh, quite important. These are things I think, I think most people here know, but it's nice to just put it in a, in a general context. So I think most people here are very interested in when all of this happens. So yeah, it sounds nice that, uh, that the banks become useful and valuable. Uh, and, and we want it to happen yesterday. And uh, so the cool thing is that I think it's all happening now. So in Switzerland, the national rail company has ticket machines all over the country and there, these things are in every town and every village, generally within walking distance. <clears throat> and these things have become distribution points for different digital assets. And uh, one of those assets actually is Bitcoin. And so now with any SPB ticket machine, you can put cash in and you can get Bitcoin out. So my favorite use case, I, I use this quite frequently. If I travel to Italy, I have euros. When I come back to Switzerland with euros, the first thing I want to do is get rid of my euros. These are worthless. So I put the euros in the machine and I get Bitcoin back out. Now it's something useful. Now I can buy a VPN or I can buy a VPS or I can register a domain name. Now it's useful. The problem is that when I use this service, I have to enter my phone number. My phone number in Switzerland is linked to my passport. This company actually has to use a tracking system by law, and it tracks every transaction that happens in Bitcoin that it can. That's what the regulators are after. So I think the future of this thing, also the, the core idea is that that's a huge cost for these companies. They don't want to be doing it. They're not actually profiting. The companies don't profit from this. <clears throat> So the, the future of, of this whole system, I think, hinges on the mobile device because the way we use money and the way we interact and, and do commerce now and in the near future all happens on our mobile device. And the key kind of missing component right now in the crypto ecosystem, I think, is the mobile wallet. I think once we have really nice mobile wallets, with a really nice user experience, then we have something we can work with. Then it becomes consumer grade. Then banking changes. So I, uh, I've been working on a project for a little while and uh, we have a team in Switzerland and we have been working on a Monero wallet for iOS. And that's called the X wallet. And 
the X Wallet is uh, is a really fun project, and uh, and it's really gotten some some attention, and I think that the X Wallet is going to change quite a bit uh, in Switzerland and uh, and around the world. So today, not many people can access private banking. Uh, only the wealthiest people in the world can can do private banking in Switzerland, but. Tomorrow, I think private banking in Switzerland can reach over a billion people because over a billion people have iPhones and all it takes is a couple taps now to download this application and start using Monero. So I think that's really where the revolution starts and that's where this really becomes big is when we reach a, a broad consumer audience and we form the right partnerships and we really build the ecosystem. So I'll end it there, thanks, thank you guys. Okay, uh, thank you, Justin, for the presentation and for the great news about the uh, XFollet. And now we have some time for uh, some questions from the audience. Uh, first one in the back. Uh, thank you for your talk. I'm also a Monero fan. I think it's one of the uh, useful projects in the cryptocurrency industry, one of the few. Uh, however, you mentioned that uh, like banks will work with Monero instead of uh, Bitcoin. First of all, I want to ask uh, if you really think so, because uh, Monero is also associated with dark markets quite a bit. So this reputational flaw can uh, deter like legit banks to use it. And my second concern is that uh, Right now, there are a lot of uh, developer teams uh, around Bitcoin working on uh, similar things uh, to uh, similar projects uh, as a Monero to create fungibility and you know anonymity around Bitcoin as well. And I think these projects are pretty legit. There are smart people working on them. So don't you think this is a threat to Monero being the only private uh, cryptocurrency? Thanks. Yeah, good good question. So two part question. First is. The Darknet Market Association, is that an issue? Uh, I think no. I think, uh, you know, everyone here and, and people around the world authorize their governments to create and issue physical cash, physical cash notes. And I think that's where the, the argument when any Darknet market is involved stops. So when you show me a government that does not produce physical cash that can be used in this way, then, then we'll have a, a discussion or a debate about that. But there aren't many governments in the world that I know of that actually do not print physical cash. So that means that they also are supporting Darknet markets. They've been doing so much longer. And they're implicitly uh, supporting Darknet markets even to this day by continuing to print cash. So that, that's my first thought uh, on, on that. And then the, the second part of the question is, <clears throat> what about the other interesting projects related to privacy and Bitcoin? Um, I, I agree, these things are quite, quite interesting. The problem is that Bitcoin by design is an open system. And when you engineer uh, a system in a certain way, then it's really, really difficult to come back to that. So, you know, we talk about Bitcoin and, and its scaling issues. Um, Bitcoin was designed in a certain way. And if you try to shoehorn it into doing something that it wasn't originally fully intended to do, then, um, then it's difficult. I guess, I guess what I'm trying to say is that Monero basically takes Bitcoin and then adds privacy to it by design. And maybe some systems, maybe some, some pull requests can, can update Bitcoin and make it just as good, if not better. But, I don't see that happening in the next five or 10 years, to, to be honest. I think, I think the pace of development in Bitcoin is, is fairly um, constant at this point. I, I would certainly welcome the change, though. I mean, options are what it's all about. Uh, good options are what it's all about. So if there are good options for strong privacy or perfect privacy in Bitcoin, then yes, let's, let's have it. 
and we'll, we'll build on it. But at the moment, I, I don't really see how, how that would happen. I, I really see Monero as being a special purpose vehicle just for privacy and to behave more as a cash-like system. I think you're going to have other trade-offs that happen in Monero. Um, and this Q&A probably isn't time to talk about it, but there are trade-offs. And Bitcoin will remain resilient in ways that Monero, I think, cannot. Uh, I have a question about the wallet, so, uh, if you're ready to release anytime soon. Uh, so I, I, ho I hope you expected this question. And also the other question is if you're writing in, in some portable framework that would uh, allow it to be ported easily to Android or some other platforms. Thank you. Yeah, great question. Um, so originally when I started this project, it was, it was a personal project. So. I didn't really think much about it. I thought, oh, it'd be a fun sort of Swift project uh, to build a native app and take advantage of Apple's native features. And the, the thing that happened is that um, the project scope <laughs> grew <laughs> really fast. And it attracted more people than I ever anticipated. And that really surprised me. And even even now, more and more people are coming to the project. They're interested in, and they'd like to help. Um, and not just on a technical level, but on a, on a business level. And so my focus has shifted now from just getting something out there and dumping something into the App Store, which was the original plan. And uh, I had hoped to do that a little while ago. But now the, now the focus is actually on building a company that can that can build and support uh, a, a commercial grade application for you know the real future. So I mean, basically, my my time frame for this app shifted from three months and then release it to what will it look like in ten years. So my perspective really changed a lot just in the last few months. So it's being worked on for sure. Uh, maybe even more fervently now than before. And it's going to be more robust than the original plan. And uh, I think when we launch it, we'll have a number of partnerships and opportunities to use it that we would not have otherwise had. So strategically, uh, this, this ecosystem is being built now. Oh, sorry, am I, am I out of time? Uh, OK, I'm on the outside so I can... Oh, OK. <laughs> yes. The, I, I think it's intentional, actually. It's a conspiracy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we should use some anonymous prediction markets to get... Yeah, it's a great idea. It's a great idea. Um, I, so, I, I forget the other part of the question, actually. Ah, is it portable? No, no, it's not. So it will be dedicated to iOS. <laughs> Why? <laughs> uh, strategic reasons. <laughs> okay, other questions? Uh, yeah. So you mentioned it's supposed to be like cash Monero, uh, which means that I would like to be able to pay it for coffee. However, there is transaction fees issues, which is coming to the question, what about second layer options like Lightning Network for Monero and such things? Is it, is it too early to speak about it or is, is there any answer about it? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. So, you know, fees have been a persistent thorn in everyone's side now for a while. It's, it's been in the Bitcoin community. And, uh, you know, my behavior changes too with fees. And the thing that I realized, though, is that with a project like the X Wallet, the, uh, the idea is that what we're doing is democratizing private Swiss banking. And if you put it in those terms, I mean, you went from only servicing people who had you know, half a billion dollars to put in their bank account to now pretty much everybody in this room can do it in the same way. I mean, if you put that in perspective, some guy was paying 500 euros for a private or a secret wire transfer, and what are we paying now to get much better privacy in our financial transactions? So I don't think that this is a retail payment solution. I mean. 
the number one thing we all think of is how we use these technologies in our daily lives as, as retail payments or as consumers. And this really is not the solution for retail payments, um, mainly because, you know, I don't, I don't really care. I, I would never pay more money for a transaction where I'm just buying coffee. That's a non-contentious transaction for me. But if I go to Indonesia and I buy a beer, maybe I'll pay a little bit more to, to keep that one uh, private. Yes. Yes, hi. Um, my question is uh, your, your X Wallet applet, uh, is it an open source application? So yes, it is. Is the source code ava available? N not yet. So it, yeah. it will be MIT licensed, and as soon as it's in the App Store, we'll release the source code. Mainly, we just want to make sure that we have the brand established first, and then we release it so that we don't have all kinds of malicious actors deploying yeah. right away. I mean, it, it, it is an iOS software, and uh, I think on, on, on iOS, um, you have uh, uh, something uh, that's called secure enclave, so all the files on the iPhone are kind of encrypted. So that also has the, the problem that you cannot really verify uh, a deterministic build, right? So uh, why, why should people trust you with their financial privacy? Uh, because all the transactions that they do, they will be recognized by your application. And I think that your application needs to have a connection back to some kind of a, a Monero full node, because you cannot store the, vo the whole Monero blockchain. So uh, how, how, how do you make sure that um, people can really feel safe and they're not monitored by your wallet or your services in the cloud? Yeah, it's a good question. So this, this kind of comes into the technical world of how Monero actually works. And so you may be familiar with, with my Monero, uh, the, the sort of web interface that, that most people use when they first start using Monero. And, and this one is a full trust environment, right? Uh, the, the back end basically is, is parsing your view key, your private view key. And originally when the project started, we had intended to use an open Monero backend as well, where the user's view key would in fact be transmitted to a remote server. And then of course there's all kinds of questions around that. And I, I really didn't like that idea in the first place because I really don't want to run a server backend. I don't want to see your view key at all, right? I don't, I don't want it. Don't want your view key. Keep it, keep it to yourself. Same, same with the liability question, right? Don't want to know what you're doing. So um, basically, I just want to provide an uh, like a nice wallet service, a, w a nice wallet experience for you. So what we, what we ended up doing is we've shifted tack now. And so what we're going to do is, is it's going to connect to uh, a remote node instead. So your entire client is actually stored on your, on your phone, and all your keys are on your phone, and they never leave. And what you're doing is you're actually just requesting data from a, a remote node. And, uh, and then really the only question at this point is, OK, we want to make sure that your remote node has the performance that, that we want it to. So we don't want people waiting too long. That's one of the problems. One of the big technical challenges Monero is the speed, right? People are used to tap and then response. So millisecond response times are what people are used to and conditioned to. But really now, because of the, the cryptographic overhead and Zcash has a lot of you know um, challenges with that as well, we have to really manage that user experience well. And so we might end up running a performance back end, but it's just a performance remote node, basically. So, I mean, maybe in the future, there's even possibility of having dedicated hardware or, or something like that. Um, but again, it's, it's a development challenge, yeah. Is it? Hi there, thanks for the talk. What is XWallet's business model? Since you're a company, how do you get profits from it? Yeah, that's a really good question. So how do you, how do you monetize something like this? How do you, 
If, if you're a crypto, crypto finance or cryptocurrency company, how do you make money if your app is in the app store? Well, number one, you're going to compromise all of your values and those of your customers if you're charging money through Apple's app store because you have to pay with a credit card through that, right? Your identity is immediately linked, and it's, it's really not what we're after. So then how do, you, how do you make money off this thing? It has to be the way that Swiss private banking works today, right? Just on a different scale. And that means that we take a, a small percentage of each outgoing transaction. So the current plan is 1% of the outgoing transaction, and it's capped at around 1 euro. So it's, again, it, it comes back to the coffee problem. There are a lot of people that, you know, will not like this, this concept too much. Um, because they intend to use this for retail payments, but in fact, it's not for retail payments. Uh, you know, maybe Lightning Network, as it matures, will, will have a solution for that. But uh, but ultimately, that's that's our business model: is is we take we we operate as many Swiss banks do today. Does X Wallet require that you run your own backend, or does it support that, or do do you have to use X Wallet's backend? Yeah, the, the idea is that when you can connect to a remote node, uh, the original spec called for being able to select your own remote node. So the idea, hopefully, with the first release is that you'll be able to type in the IP address of your remote node that you're running and connect to it. And then you'll be responsible for your own performance then at that point. But yeah, that, I think that's important to support. Other questions? Hi, great talk. <clears throat> if you don't mind, uh, uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to criticize the privacy, the so-called privacy of Monero a little. So let's talk about Ring City. Uh, when I was still uh, contributing to Monero, uh, it seemed like this is the best governance model in cryptocurrencies that I've ever seen, except for the fact that Fluffy and Luigi likes to um, hide the fact about the security parameter of Ring City. There is this law in cryptography that promising privacy is much worse than uh, storing stuff in plain text. And this is what Ring City is about, because the security parameter there, uh, Ring signatures only protect me from uh, nasty three-letter agencies from differentiating my transaction from a group of people's trans transactions. And that number is really low. So like an RFC standard for security parameters is one minus one divided by two on the power of 256. And for Monero, it's 0 0.9. That's like unacceptable. So first, before adopting uh, Monero into Swiss private banking, we have to make Monero private and ready. What's your opinion in this accusation of mine? Yeah, I, I'm always open to the, the, the technical questions. I, I also have, have questions. And, you know, I, I think it's a really important question to ask because it's still, very, it's a still a very young technology. Um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a challenging question. And my answer is that most people don't like the 1% fee, but it's there to basically start to address some of these questions. So. We need to be able to figure out for ourselves how to provide clients, how to provide our corporate partners with the assurance that they need that within whatever probability, you know, nothing, nothing comes on the radar. Um, essentially, it, it comes back to this question of what is a bank's role in the future? And I think that's part of the bank's role in the future. And it, that's, a, that's something that really we have to finance and we have to work on and we have to bring in outside eyes. Because I, I agree with you that there are systemic risks that we need to, we need to address. Last question. Thanks. Uh, I want to ask, what's your opinion about the hardware wallet implementation of Monero? Yeah, that's a really good question. It, it also kind of hits on my strategic direction. So I would love to have the convergence of hardware and software happen on the iPhone. And that's really where I'm headed with this thing.
So I, I think that it's good to have other options. You know, I love, love my Trezors and, uh, and I love hardware wallets and they definitely have a role. And, uh, and I think that role becomes only more important in time. But I think for the consumer experience, we need hardware that we can, we can actually trust. And I think Apple is moving in that direction too. Okay, so thank you very much for your presentation. Hope you enjoyed it.